could further improve that, then I'm certainly interested in, in hearing from them. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 4086 in the name of Alec Neil on the Social Care Self Directed Support Scotland Bill. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak buttons. And I'll just give the front bench a few minutes to get themselves sorted. I call on Michael Matheson to speak to you and move the motion in the name of Alec Neil. Minister, you've got 13 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm delighted to open this debate on the general principles of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill. I'd like to begin, though, by uh, thanking a number of uh, people. Uh, I'd like to thank Duncan McNeil and his colleagues on the Health and Sport Committee and their clerking team for the careful and robust way in which they have scrutinised our proposals and their considered conclusions in the Stage 1 report. The Finance and the Subordinate Legislation Committee for the part that they have played in scrutinising the Bill and the many witnesses who have provided evidence to uh, the committees through their consideration. I'd also like to offer my thanks to the organisations and individuals who have helped to shape our policy on self-directed support over a number of years. Their input has helped to ensure that this Bill will make a difference to the lives of people who access care and support and also for their carers. Each one of us in this chamber at some point in our lives will need to draw on care and support services for ourselves or for someone in our family. We must ensure that we plan, design and provide services in a way which best meets the needs of people now and into the future. People have told us that greater choice and control are key to better outcomes and therefore we need to empower people to play a full and active part in designing their own solutions to their support needs, working in partnership with professionals. This is not only a more sustainable approach to delivering and planning public services, it's also an approach which is better for people, carers, families and for communities as a whole. This is a kind of approach that was called for by the Christie Commission and indeed the Commission recognised the role of self-directed support and the role that it can play in reshaping social care. However, they also noted the current low uptake in self-directed support and called for more action to build capacity and awareness of self-directed support in order to encourage broader participation. I'm strongly committed to self-directed support, not just as a a concept which embodies the ideas of equality, human rights and independent living, but also as a mechanism which delivers practical, tangible benefits to many people, their families and their carers right across Scotland. It's a privilege to hear directly from people who receive social care services and also from their carers in communities right across the country about the positive difference that self-directed support makes to their lives. I was particularly pleased that the Health and Sport Committee had a chance to hear from a variety of individuals, including Omar and Margaret, in their final evidence session about what self-directed support means to them personally. It's clear from their experience that giving people more choice, more control and a greater say in their own support, whatever they might choose to do with that, leads to improved outcomes and a better overall experience for them. Stories such as these strengthen my resolve to ensure that the ambitions of self-directed support are realised for the benefit of all people eligible for social care. I'm very pleased, therefore, that there has been significant support for this bill, both in the earlier consultation phases and in its parliamentary passage to date. The I'll give way to the member. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to Mr Matheson for giving way. I mean, the, he set out very well the benefits of self-directed support. He'll be aware, I'm sure, that um, Orkney Islands Council um, has, in some senses, led the way in terms of the number of, of those receiving self-directed support, albeit um, smaller amounts. 
And will he recognise there are specific um, constraints on smaller local authorities to, to deliver those packages because of the economies they can, uh, of scale they can, they can deliver in other areas in terms of service provision? Minister? I recognise the work that uh, Orkney Council have taken forward in this area. There are a number of local authorities that do have a good track record in promoting self-directed support. And there are specific challenges around rurality and the provision of certain services and within uh, small communities. And I know that Orkney Council will always work hard in order to try and deliver the best range of services they can uh, within uh, the limitations that they can achieve because of those uh, challenges. And self-directed support, I think, provides an opportunity to look at other options uh, that may not traditionally have been considered and how care can be designed, designed for individuals and how they can then take that forward to meet their own individual care needs. Members of the Health and Sport Committee uh, will hopefully have seen my written response to the Stage 1 report, but it's uh, worth summarising some of the main points, as I've no doubt they will be touched upon in the course of the debate here this afternoon. Firstly, I welcome the widespread support for the principles we have placed at the forefront of this bill, informed choice, control and participation. I'm always open to potential improvements and therefore my officials are exploring the committee's recommendation that there should be also a direct reference to the principle of independent living on the face of the bill. In relation to the allocation of budgets by local authorities, I share the committee's view that self-directed support must not be or be seen to be a cover for cuts. Local authorities have a responsibility to meet a person's assessed eligible needs under the Social Work Scotland Act, no matter which option they choose in self-directed support. We will ensure that this is made very clear in the framework of statutory and best practice guidance which will accompany the legislation. I also agree with... I'll give way to the member. I thank the Minister for that. You were, you were touching on the idea of uh, self-directed support not being a cover for cuts. Could it, would it be helpful to put on record that Glasgow City Council will cut its social work budget by 20% in the last year, but only get a 3.4% cut in its revenue budget? What would you say to people looking for self-directed support in Glasgow who might see that this self-directed support model being used as a cover for cuts within that city? Minister? I think the key issue here is the point that I was making is that uh, irrespective of someone's choice under self-directed support, a local authority remains under a legal obligation to meet the needs of that person's assessed eligibility. Uh, and that stands for any local authority, Glasgow City Council or any other. And clearly where individuals feel as though the system within an individual local authority is not meeting their needs sufficiently, then they should use the processes within that local authority in order to pursue that matter further. I also agree with the committee that it's important to identify and share best practice in relation to complaints and appeals process. Following a consultation this year on how social work complaints procedures might be updated, a working group is being set up which, amongst other things, uh, will look at whether there is a need for a separation of disputes and the complaints process. And my officials will ensure that the committee's views on this issue are passed on to the group for further consideration. The committee raised the specific question of whether support for adult carers provided for in the bill should be a power or a duty. I am acutely aware of the contribution unpaid carers make, and I share the view that supporting their health and well-being is hugely important. The vital point here is that we create the right legislative and policy framework for carers to be supported appropriately. I believe that a power rather than a duty gives us in Scotland the necessary flexibility to meet our ambition to provide early preventative support to carers. Combined with the investment through the Change Fund, the Carers Information Strategy and the Short Breaks Fund and the work in other areas such as dementia, autism and mental health, we're already working hard to help to support carers in Scotland. This bill provides a further important tool for local authorities to continue to ensure that they support carers in the most flexible and appropriate way. 
Self-directed support applies to children and their families, as well as adults. And I'm pleased to note that the committee supports this position. It's in line with the principles of getting it right for every child. And I believe that it can be a real benefit to children and young people and their families. However, I also note concerns about the specifics of applications to children, particularly around issues relating to transition. I can assure all members that uh, we will make sure that the guidance which is developed around the bill will have specific information on support to children and around transition planning. And we will draw attention for practitioners and providers to this guidance through a variety of means. Although direct payments for children's support are well established as an option, there is considerable scope for extending availability to many more children. And I'm confident, along with the, conf the work we're taking forward at present, that we can further develop this area in a positive way. One of the great strengths of self-directed support is the flexibility that it affords individuals. And a key factor in that flexibility is the workforce. However, I appreciate that there are some concerns around personal assistance, who provides some of the most flexible support. Certainly, there are some risks inherent in employing or being employed as a PA, but I believe that these are manageable and that current safeguards are proportionate. Therefore, we have no plans to require the compulsory registration of PAs with the SSC or any other body. However, I also share the committee's view that we need to enhance the status and value of personal assistance. And in, many, in, my, in my written response, I also discussed the wide range of actions which are being developed or we already have underway to help to support PAs and their employers. I believe that the emphasis should be on enhancing the capacity of professionals, individuals and their carers to make the right choice to best meet their needs. Closely related to the question of personal assistance is the issue of employment of family members. Again, I believe that our approach here it should be one of flexibility and proportionality. I welcome the committee's agreement that the current definition of exceptional circumstances is no longer appropriate. If the bill uh, is uh, enacted, I intend to launch a consultation on regulations which will include appropriate and inappropriate circumstances for the employment of a close relative. The aim is to move towards a culture that seeks to identify appropriate circumstances rather than one which focuses on exceptional circumstances. Clearly, safeguards will be important and I expect this to be fully explored during the consultation exercise. Finally, a brief word on costs. I know the, the financial resources accompanying this bill have been a source of concern for some. However, I'm confident that the transformational funding which has been allocated to local authorities, providers and advice and support organisations will be sufficient to support a significant improvement in the provision of self-directed support options across Scotland. My officials have held several meetings, both with COSLA and ADSW, and we will continue to meet with them in the run-up to the implementation phase of the legislation. In addition, my officials have also started a programme of visits to local authorities, which is aimed at gathering useful information about transformational processes across Scotland. This bill, presiding officer, raises a number of very important and complex issues. And I'm sure that we will hear much more about these over the course of the debate. However, I would like to close for now by reminding members that whilst the detail of this bill is of crucial importance and it's right and proper that it's thoroughly scrutinised and discussed, the overall purpose of this legislation is about making a difference to the lives of those in our society who need to access social care and support. We owe it to them to deliver real change. I move that the Parliament agrees the general principles of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill. Thank you very much. I now call on Duncan McMeal to speak on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee 
up to nine minutes, please, Mr. McNeill. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Legislation, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, and policy uh, making can be an impersonal uh, business. But I want to recount a very human story, um, which uh, is partly been referred to today, was the, the story of uh, Omar Haq. He's in a, uh, he is a, an intelligent young man with his life and career ahead of him. He graduated a couple of years ago with a master's degree in human resources management and is currently looking for work. Employers take note. Omar has cerebral palsy and he spoke eloquently to the committee during our stage one consideration of the bill about the positive impact having access to self-directed support has had on his life. Of the bill's four options for self-directed support, Omar uses direct payments to employ a personal assistant. He described his personal assistant as fulfilling, fulfilling a personal need, enabling him to go about his day-to-day -day activities, including travelling on a bus and helping fill out application forms. Ultimately, the flexibility offered by direct payments enables Omar to take more control over not just his care, but his life raises his ambition to what is possible, drives him on to greater levels of, uh, of independence. Um, and this striving for independent living is at the very heart of what this bill is aiming to achieve. The committee received compelling evidence also from Pam Duncan of Independent Living Scotland that we should not be too focused on the process of self-directed support as an end in itself. Instead, we were urged to look at its ability to empower those using it, to lead independent lives so that they may participate in society and live a full and ordinary life. As in Omar's case, then it's not just the system of support which is important, but what the system enables people to achieve. The committee believes that this core principle of independent living should be more explicit in the bill. And I welcome the Scottish Government's uh, commitment to explore the possibility of such an amendment. There are high expectations that this bill will bring greater freedom, choice, dignity, indeed control for people like Omar who require social care to maintain a quality of life and to fulfil their potential. However, during the course of the committee's scrutiny, we heard the changes required of local authorities and, and independent and voluntary sector providers to, to ensure the success of this policy described as, uh, as dramatic, wide-ranging, very difficult for them. In, in every area we heard uh, we heard evidence from practitioners uh, about the files that need to be kept, the individual files that need to be kept, rather than collected. It's, you know, seismic, uh, uh, as it was described. Local authorities seem to be in a, vi a variety uh, of states of readiness. Uh, some are further down the line than others, uh, such as, uh, you know, decommissioning group uh, to creating individual budgets around packages, embedding, in, embedding the concept of self-directed support in their own assessment and care management processes. Concerns were also raised with us about the impact of the approach of some councils in their implementation of self-directed support on the service user. So it gets all very complex at that level, it would seem. But there are, they, they are no less problems uh, uh, for, for, for that. We drilled down below that... Uh, uh, Below those usual suspects for evidence taken in the bill, we found invaluable the insight provided by service users and carers at discussion sessions coordinated by the Princess Royal Trust for Carers and Independent Living in Scotland project. We heard some strong views uh, expressed by individuals about the implementation of self-directed support along, alongside uh, the assessment processes, as, 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 as Bob Doris mentioned in Glasgow. The negativity 
uh, uh, was put into uh, context by some service users who had been on the receiving uh, uh, end of cuts to their budget. So for them, it, it wasn't uh, an empower it got off to a bad start. It wasn't a, an empowering process. Self-directed support, as we've said earlier, and, and I was pleased to hear the minister recognise the issue. It cannot be seen to, come, to be a camouflage for cuts. It's very important, the perception of this, because, you know, in terms of you know, poisoning the process at an early stage where, where, where things seem to be imposing people. It was a cuts agenda and denying the opportunities that this legislation would offer people. The Scottish Government must ensure that the system is robust and that service users are offered a package which meets their needs. I understand that officials uh, are working with COSLA to, uh, to assess whether there is merit in establishing a national threshold for access to formal support. And maybe the Minister can say something about that uh, uh, later. Where disputes do arise regarding individual social care assessment, we believe that the statutory complaints procedure is inappropriate for that, for that purpose. As the Law Society told the committee, appeals procedures are about saying that we think that something has not gone, gone right and asking where we, we want to get to and what we want to put in place. Complaints procedures tend to be backward-looking and focused on apportioning blame. Local authorities need to make clear distinction between complaints and appeals. We urge the forthcoming Scottish Government Working Group on Social Work Complaints Procedures to endorse this need uh, for such a uh, distinction. And I, I, I heard the Minister's comments earlier that that work is going on. As well as focusing on service users, the committee scrutiny took into account the views of unpaid carers. For without Scotland's army of unpaid carers, uh, our health and social care system as we know, would grind to a halt. They play a vital role in the provision of care in Scotland. We heard firsthand from carers of their desire for the discretionary power proposed becoming a duty on local authorities to provide support following an assessment. Florence Burke of Carers Trust suggested that potentially a small investment for carers who want to take up self-directed support in their own right could go a long way. It could, she told us, even help to maintain the £10 billion savings to the public purse that carers can provide by giving unpaid support. We recognise that it is vitally important that carers are given the support to protect their own physical and mental uh, well-being. The bill should underline that most moral of imperatives. Another key strand is the cost of its implementation particularly at a time of reduced budgets. There's a major discrepancy in how much the bill will cost to implement. With COSLA estimating it could cost double the amount claimed by the Scottish Government. This difference is so, <laughs> it's so great that it can't be, it can't be explained uh, simply uh, by the use of different methodologies uh, and the failure of COSLA to share with the committee the details of individual cost estimates by local authorities is just unacceptable. It's not acceptable to come to a committee and not to be, be prepared to, to, to stand up your argument. It's meant that uh, as a committee we are unable to determine whether the funding gap identified is real or imaginary. I am therefore uh, very keen to seek assurances that, um, that, that these resources are indeed sufficient to ensure the bill can be implemented effectively. And I look forward to hearing uh, your further updates of, um, of the Minister, which the Minister described as the ongoing discussions that are taking place. But seriously, they need to be out in the open. This is not something that, that, that's for back rooms and uh, all of that, that sort of stuff. And uh, the committees are there please. to provide that service. Um, the presiding officer, the bill holds challenges for the service users and service providers alike. However, we believe that placing the policy of self-directed support into legislation should ensure uh, uh, uptake, promote greater consistency of approach across local authorities. And we welcome the proposed legislation. We are very, thank you. Uh, we're very tight for time today, so 
Jackie Bailey now, up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this stage one debate on the self-directed support bill, and I associate myself with the minister's thanks to all those involved in shaping and scrutinising the bill. Now, I'm sure the minister will forgive me for saying that this has been a long time coming. It was promised for the last parliament, but, but I understand sacrificed in negotiations with COSLA just before the 2011 elections, as there were legitimate concerns about funding, and as Duncan McNeill has explained, there remain legitimate concerns about funding. Now the bill returns, some would say a pale imitation of its previous incarnation, but perhaps a more practical set of measures, and therefore a greater opportunity of creating some change at a local level. And on that basis, that the bill does extend choice and control for people receiving social care, we on the Labour benches will be pleased to support the general principles of the bill this evening. But before I consider specific areas of the bill, I want to look at the policy context for self-directed support, and of course in its widest form, personalisation. Because personalisation was advanced first by the previous UK Labour government, working alongside disabled people. It is, of course, much wider than social care. It is about all the different things that contribute to the way we live our lives, our education, housing, employment, health, transport, and so on. It is not intended to be a narrow focus on social care alone. It is about empowering those with additional needs to shape their lives in a way which suits them. And I hope the Scottish Government will in due course consider the wider possibilities of personalization. But let me look to social care for an illustration. Now, many of us will have constituents, many of them older people, who benefit from a tuck-in service, helping them get ready for bed every night. Now, nine times out of 10, that tuck-in service will be delivered between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that goes to bed quite that early in the evening. And that, well, okay, Jackson Carlaw does, presiding officer. Old age, old age is clearly advancing. But these times, these times are perhaps more about the interest of the service and lack the flexibility to respond to the person's individual needs. So self-directed support mm -hmm. is about exercising a degree of choice and control that makes life better. But let me outline some of the specific concerns that have been raised. Firstly, the independent living movement is very clear that the bill should be viewed as a mechanism to support disabled people and those living with long-term conditions to realise independent living. And I know the Minister in his evidence to the committee agreed, and I'm very pleased today um, that he's going to give further consideration to strengthening the bill with perhaps a clear statement of intent or words about independent living on the face of the bill. The statement should recognise that disabled people have a right to independent living, that it will empower those using self-directed support to have the same freedom choice, dignity and control as other citizens at home, at work and in the community so they may participate in society and live an ordinary life. And that approach is supported by a powerful range of organisations including Inclusion Scotland, the Health and Social Care Alliance, Self-Directed Support Scotland and Independent Living in Scotland. Secondly, let me consider the whole question of advocacy. There is no doubt that whilst the bill seeks to extend choice and control so that there is greater direction over how support is provided, there does remain a need for independent advocacy. We know from experience that it can be difficult for some people to negotiate through what's often quite different and complex choices and they require assistance and guidance in doing so. A right to advocacy included in the bill will ensure that the very provisions of the bill that we all support do in fact become a reality for all. Thirdly, there is the question of an appeals mechanism. As the bill is written, it seems to me that the local authority determines needs, provides what they believe are the appropriate services to meet those needs, but there then is only an internal complaints procedure if things go wrong. Now, whilst there may be access to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, they really look at the process by which a decision is made rather than the substance. And my experience tells me that you generally need money to access a judicial review. So it's not as comprehensive as having perhaps an independent and impartial tribunal so that appeals are robust. Indeed, as I understand it from Capability Scotland, the Scottish Committee of the Administrative Justice and Tribunals Commission, never heard of them before, but this month they recommended the establishment of a new tribunal jurisdiction to deal with appeals against community care decisions. The absence of an appeals procedure ultimately has the effect 
of weakening rights, and I hope the Minister will indeed take the time to further reflect on this. Thirdly, there is a concern about the postcode lottery of care, and in particular, care charging. It's not an issue that's new to this chamber. I've been raising it consistently for three, if not four years, and I am genuinely disappointed that the government and COSLA have taken so long to resolve this. Oh yes, there is a working group. I've said this before, it was, if it was on performance-related pay, it wouldn't be earning very much at all. Apparently, it's all too difficult. Well, frankly, it's not acceptable in a country of this size for a service um, to have such wild variations in charging as were demonstrated in my own area. £30 per week for a service in Western Bartonshire, £300 per week for the same service in neighbouring Argyll and Butte. Different charges, different criteria, and a lack of transparency and fairness. It should be the case, wherever you live in Scotland, that you should pay broadly the same, and the criteria for charging should be the same too. But you know, the, not on this point, but you know the postcode lottery um, in charging could well have a negative impact on the ability of disabled people to direct their own support in a meaningful way. So will the Minister ensure that rapid progress is indeed made in developing a national framework for the provision of and charging for care? Because we do need fairness and transparency in this area once and for all. Fourthly, there is the matter of balance between individual and collective services. And let's take, for example, daycare centres, much valued by their users as a means of providing social interaction, yet their very existence could be threatened by the withdrawal of funding. Now, whilst I absolutely acknowledge that self-directed support wouldn't prevent an individual from continuing to use a daycare centre if they chose to do so, that is not the practical experience on the ground. So perhaps more thought needs to be given to the transition for collective services, and there needs to be sufficient financial support to underpin this so we don't have the perverse consequence of losing valuable services. Let me turn briefly, presiding officers, to the position of carers. There is a call from carers' organisations and carers themselves that the bill should contain a duty to support unpaid carers so they are able to receive direct payments in their own right following an assessment. And I sympathise both with their view and also with the Minister's approach, not least because the contribution that carers make is invaluable. And by supporting carers, we spend to save. But I suspect this will require additional funding in some sort, and I would be interested to hear if the Minister has made an assessment of this, never mind ensuring carers have their needs assessed in the first place. Carers already have the right to an assessment, which is difficult for them to access. Their view is that a discretionary power is perhaps not enough, and I would welcome the Minister's consideration of this. Finally, presiding officer, let me turn my attention to the integration of health and social care. This should be the developing policy that dominates the Parliament's discourse rather than an obsession mm -hmm. with separation. We need nothing short of a transformation of people's experience of health and social care so that no one falls through the gaps. We may disagree about the means, presiding officer, but we don't disagree about the need for integration. The challenging demographics alone underline the need to act and to act decisively. Labour believes in the creation of a national care service as radical as the creation of the NHS over 60 years ago, with local delivery, local accountability, a seamless service joining up health and social care with a framework of minimum standards and an end to the postcode lottery. Self-directed support is an important step in that journey. It is disappointing that it's only focused on social care. The Scottish Government had a pilot on self-directed support in health, and I would want to explore the opportunity in a limited number of cases where their health needs overlap their now, social please. care needs of moving that forward. In closing, presiding officer, the bill is an opportunity not to be missed, but it does need further improvement. We will work with the Government on that to ensure that it truly supports choice, control and independent living. Thank you. Many thanks. Now, Colin Nanette Milne, up to six minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, in my nine years plus as a member of this parliament, I haven't previously been closely involved with a bill which has had such widespread support for its general principles as the one we're discussing this afternoon. This is because it will introduce legislation which, if properly implemented, will embody the principles of independent living for everyone, giving to all citizens the same freedom, choice, dignity and control in their lives, whether they're at home, at work or in the community. 
and it will give everyone the right to secure practical assistance and support, to participate in society and to live an ordinary life, something which hasn't been achieved to date and which is emphasised in the briefing sent to us by Independent Living in Scotland, Inclusion Scotland and others, who see it as crucial that the bill is viewed as a mechanism to support disabled people and those who live with long-term conditions to realise the reality of independent living. The current system of direct payments to those who wish to select and pay for some or all of their social care entitlement, I think, was first introduced in the late 1990s and hasn't worked as intended, the uptake being less in Scotland than south of the border and patchy across the country. And it is widely felt that legislation is now required to enable everyone to choose how they wish to receive the social care they require. The only dissenting voice has been COSLA, who do not see the need for legislation at the present time. We've heard previously the four options on a sliding scale which will be available under the legislation to those assessed as requiring a package of social care, and I won't repeat them now. Of course, SDS options are currently available to service users, but the bill would place a duty on councils both to offer them and to act on the service user's choice and should result in greater consistency of provision across local authorities. Whilst it's implicit within the bill, I agree with witnesses such as Independent Living in Scotland that the principles of independent living should be made more explicit by di direct reference to this on the face of the bill, and I'm pleased that the Minister is exploring the possibility of an amendment to this effect. I'm also attracted to the suggestion of including a statement of intent within the bill to further strengthen the link between SDS and its role in supporting independent living. If the legislation is to be effective, there will have to be a clear focus onto the requirements of the service user rather than the provider, and a market will emerge for service users as SDS develops. It may be, for instance, that in the fullness of time, facilities such as council-run day centres will cease to be required if that's generally not what is wanted by service users. So there are bound to be tensions and a required change of culture in how the public sector meets individual needs, which will no doubt throw up problems along the way. But the general thrust has been that the end result of real independent living is what should be available in a fair 21st century Scotland. The Royal College of Nursing voiced concern should users opt to use social care resources to pay for a health-related provision, such as physiotherapy, or vice versa. But that, I think, is per perhaps precisely what should be happening if that is what would give the user most benefit, and it's not readily available within the NHS. Hopefully this sort of issue will be dealt with as the integration of health and social care proceeds. And personally, uh, I eagerly await the details of the government's proposed legislation on that. Indeed, I feel that the benefits of SDS will only be fully realised once the promised integration is complete. There are legitimate concerns about some parts of the bill, such as the lack of an appeals process and the failure to include the right to independent advocacy as a statutory provision. There are issues around support for adult carers, which the Minister has spoken about, which the carers' organisation would like to see as a duty rather than a discretionary power on local authorities. And there are concerns surrounding the management of transition planning from children's services to adult services, particularly from school to further education. Also worrying a number of people is the government's decision not to regulate personal assistance, but instead to rely on the Protecting Vulnerable Groups scheme to mitigate some of the risks for those wishing to employ a PA. And I'm not sure that the response given by the Minister will completely reassure those who raised the concerns. I notice plans to launch a consultation exercise on the employment of relatives by service users once the bill is approved, and I look forward to that. <clears throat> Finally, there have been disagreements between COSLA and the government, as we've heard, about the cost estimates of implementation of the bill's provisions and whether promised government resources will indeed be sufficient to facilitate the process of change required to do this. I'm pleased that these discussions will continue. Presiding officer, whilst there are a number of important details and concerns to be dealt with as this bill goes through the parliamentary process, and no doubt there'll be forthcoming amendments from those who think that changes need to be made, I think that overall there is a consensus that this legislation will be of significant benefit to those assessed as requiring social care, and provided it is not perceived as a cost-cutting opportunity, but rather the chance to give greater independence and a better quality of life to service users, then I think this bill, particularly in conjunction with the forthcoming integration of health and social care legislation, will be widely welcomed across Scotland. I do, however, agree with Bernardo Scotland that there will need to be robust oversight of the implementation of self-directed support, 
with sanctions being imposed on the local authorities which are deemed to be failing. However, overall, Scottish Conservatives will be happy to support the general principles of the Bill this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Uh, now call on Gil Patterson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. As someone who supports uh, the principle of independence for Scotland and doing a bit of uh, multi multitasking, uh, I, of course, fully support the Bill uh, as it empowers people with disabilities to have more control over their lives. That is the key message which is driving this legislation forward, giving disabled people the same freedom, dignity, dignity and choice as their fellow citizens in all walks of life. As a member of the Health and Sports Committee, I listened to a great deal of evidence during the meetings on the bill, from organisations with stakes in this issue to individuals who live with it on a daily basis. The, levels of e the level of evidence was wide-ranging and informative. That opportunity has given me a higher level of clarity on what is needed to ensure everyone in Scotland is given every opportunity to achieve the, the sum some level of choice and control to their living. At the present time, there are two options for receiving support that are available to people with disabilities. Direct payment involves a local authority paying the supported person directly to them, to, who then spends the money on the support required. We also have a more traditional method where local authorities are given the responsibility to select the support required and make payment without a direct involvement with the supported person. The bill aims to strengthen both of these methods whilst offering a further options. In some cases, people would feel generally more confident if they could choose the support they receive but not be burdened with having to deal with the financial side of the equation. The bill off, off, offers uh, this aspect to people while recognising that individuals uh, have different levels of need in terms of support, which is why I'm pleased the fourth option is a mixture of the three already set out. This bill, bill aims to consolidate, modernise and clarify existing laws on direct payments, which is hoped will turn, in turn lead to an increased uptake of direct funding, thus expanding the empowerment of the disabled persons. But as well as helping disabled persons take more control over their lives, there is another aspect of the legislation that is invaluable. As will be uh, the case with most, if not all, members in this chamber, a week seldom goes by without uh, constituents uh, uh, contacting uh, our offices to help uh, on carer issues. As the unsung heroes of Scottish society, carers need all the help they can get, and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has announced a number of initiatives to uh, alleviate the problem. The, the investment of £24 million over the next three years in direct support will be welcomed by a, a carers across Scotland, as will the allocation of £46 million to support carers of older people through the Change Fund. That will uh, be spread over the next uh, three years. But of course, more can be done, and I'm sure that the Scottish Government will look further into how it can support those who require further assistance. However, a major concern to some people in receipt of support is the prospect of a close family member using undue influence in order to be, in, in, to be the employed provider of the support to the disabled. The fear being that because there is money involved, then the need for additional income for the family member may be greater than the need for high quality support for those with disabilities. And because the family situation, uh, because of the family situation, then the strength of being an employer has the potential to be lost by those unable or unwilling, for whatever reason, to say no to a family member being employed to look after them. Especially if that individual family member being employed is not equipped to look after someone to the high level demanded and expected. And of course, if pressure is mounted by a family member, 
to have a particular person to have a particular person appointed, a situation will arise where an employee, an employer, i.e., the disabled person, will be forced to effectively fire someone who has been doing the job to a good standard and perhaps over a considerable uh, period of time. The goal of the independent living, in my view, would be completely counterproductive in trying to give more control over uh, their own lives to people with dis disabilities and would be creating matters uh, that restrict further measure, uh, measures to empower them to live more independently if family coercion was in place. And lastly, just how difficult will it be to fire a family member who is not up to the job or deal with someone who partway through a chore decides that he has, they have done enough for that particular moment. So I'm really pleased that the government, I, I, I listened carefully to the statement and I'm pleased that the government has taken this matter seriously indeed and have looked at the possibilities of the failings in human nature and uh, are consulting some meaningful, uh, for some meaningful instructions and guidance to ensure that ass assessments are regular and meaningful in order the individual receiving support, support is protected. You must close now, please. I very much want to thank the government on this matter in attempting uh, to provide the solutions to tackle the potential difficulty. Yes, uh, a presiding officer, we all please want close. to see people have control of a, cho a, a choice, and it's essential. And I very much support uh, the government in the deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, uh, Presiding officer, I welcome this uh, bill, which is the first in this uh, area of policy since the Community Care and Health Act of 2002, which extended the scope of direct payments to all care client groups. Self-directed support, however, is about much more than direct payments, and I particularly welcome new option two, whereby the supported person decides the support, but the local authority arranges it. Self-directed support requires profound cultural change to make it work properly, as well as action on postcode care, the postcode care issue, which will require some central direction, as Jackie Bailey outlined. Culture change is certainly necessary, because it is not that long ago that the City of Edinburgh Council was preparing to change the social care provision for hundreds of disabled people without any consultation with those who were about to lose a, a trusted carer. Now, that was stopped because of a, a great campaign against it, but it does lead me to agree totally with what Professor Frank Clark said at the committee on the 15th of May at column 2265. The situation, he said, is a bit like what happened with the integration of health and social care, in that there is no point in getting the structure light unless practitioners on the ground behave differently. That is partly about training and it is certainly about an understanding of the personalisation agenda in health and social care and a determination to do things with people rather than to them. Self-directed support has to be about promoting human rights and independent living rather than about consumerism and the cost of services. To make this work effectively, however, I believe there has to be investment in independent advice and advocacy to support people to access self-directed support. This is something that Age Concern and the Scottish Association of Mental Health both uh, argued for in their submission for their respective client groups. It is also crucial that people should get the appropriate level of direct payment and related to that that they should be charged fairly where charging is uh, permissible. I think that more central direction is required for that via a framework of standards, and I also believe that an appeal system is probably necessary to ensure equity. Thank you, Bob Doris. Thank the member for giving way on charge. I know it's a vexed issue, the expression postcode lottery is sometimes used, but would you accept that Charging is sometimes directly related to the amount of money local authorities decide to invest in their social work department and there's a local democratic choice there. Yes, we have to monitor it nationally, but there's a real local democratic choice in how much local authorities want to invest in their social work department. Malcolm this is going to become quite an issue, not just in the discussion of this bill, but in terms of the forthcoming health and social care legislation, because there are always balances, and I've been having a, a Twitter conversation with Rosanna Cunningham and others uh, over the weekend about this, between local 
uh, local decision making and national decision making. And, and my general view on this is that there does need to be a bit more national direction, a framework of standards, because otherwise people feel that it's simply not fair. And I think it is a threat to this excellent legislation if, if people are going to be charged very different amounts and assessed in different ways. So that's why I do think that we need a framework of standards and an appeal mechanism. Now, I accept that there aren't large sums of uh, extra money uh, available uh, for uh, this particular uh, uh, policy, uh, but it is important to ensure that self-directed support is not used uh, as a cost-cutting exercise. And I think uh, the principle uh, uh, of equivalence of resource is very important uh, as part of this legislation. There are fears about costs, and Duncan McNeill talked about the, the COSLA views on that, but I think we should remember the Professor David Bell report, which said that the social uh, self-directed support costs were similar similar to those of uh, existing uh, uh, commissioned uh, services. Of course, the issue of bridging costs has been recognised for a long time, and I, thought, I found it interesting that the financial memorandum was drawing on the direct payments finance project report of 2003. But in fact, the situation has got easier since then because of the move from block to spot contracts. So I think those issues can be resolved. Now, there are lots of other issues which will be discussed at stage two in more detail. And if I can just touch on two or three in the remaining time, I have personal assistants are not in, we're not included in the Regulation of Care Act. Uh, but I do think there is an issue here. I note that Bernardo's call for a register of carers and personal assistants eligible to be employed. I'm not sure if we need to go that far, but I am sure that uh, we should certainly make sure that uh, they're all covered by the Protection of Vulnerable Groups scheme. And I think that uh, perhaps the government should look at the Triple SC recommendations on this, because I do think there does need to be some kind of protection for vulnerable people, because many of the potential employers, as Sam H pointed out, will be uh, vulnerable uh, people. Um, I uh, agree with what the Minister said about family members. I think the move from uh, exceptional to appropriate is entirely uh, right in, in that uh, regard. I, I do think the whole issue about the interplay uh, between uh, this legislation and health and social care, the health and social care integration agenda, needs some uh, greater clarity. And in a sense, it's unfortunate that we're not discussing the two pieces of legislation together. But in that regard, I would uh, support uh, paragraph 199 in the committee's report, which is encourages the Scottish Government to ensure that the principles of self-directed support enshrined in this bill can be extended to address the health needs of people also in receipt uh, of uh, social care. Um, the final point uh, uh, relates to children and young people. I, I strongly support their inclusion within this, but I was interested in Bernardo's uh, comment that not enough evaluation had been done. So I do think it is important that we should have of a full analysis of the current projects involving children and families. But in general, I certainly believe that they should be included within this legislation. Many, many thanks. Now, Colin Richard Lyle to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, President uh, Officer. The Self-Directed Support Bill offers uh, an opportunity to adults and children, social care users, the choice and control over their social care enshrined in law. This government, I believe, will support independent living and support the people's right to participate in our society to the full and help them to live quite rightly an ordinary life. In order to do this, we must redouble our efforts to increase the take-up of self-directed support. We must shift the balance of power towards users of support and services, not just the balance of care towards home and community. Independent living means that supported people of all ages have the same freedom. I like that word, freedom. They have the choice, the dignity and the control over the lives that many of our citizens of this country presently enjoy. Supported people can exercise their rights and their duties of being a citizen of this country in a full and equal way and participate in all they do within the framework of society. SDS is, I believe, the essential practical assistance to ensure that they are free to live their life in any way an individual wishes to and to do it with dignity a person deserves. I know that this SNP government is committed to Scotland's estimated 650,000 unpaid carers and I would agree that the extension of direct payments to carers in this bill is further proof of this. And I further know that over £46 to £47 million pounds will be invested in self-directed support over the spending review period. I would, su would suggest more of what happened in the past will not work now in a modern-day Scotland. 
Legislation is required to ensure a supported person has greater choice and control over the services that they receive and need to live their life to the full and to ensure consistency of provision. Progress has been made on increasing uptake of direct funding and now legislation is required to ensure greater progress is made in this issue. This bill will give four options. Direct payment. The local authority makes a direct payment to the supported person for them to spend on the support they require. Directing available budget. The supported person selects their support, which is then arranged for by the local authority. Local authority arranged service. The local council selects the support to be provided and makes arrangements for it. Combination of eligible options. A mixture of the first three options to suit an individual's needs. As a member of the Health and Sport Committee up to Stage 1, I would like to thank the Committee Convener and the Deputy Convener for bringing this excellent report to this Chamber for debate. I am sure that this Bill will receive the support it deserves and I will monitor its progress through this Parliament and I am sure that many other people will also do so. The Self-Directed Support Bill is a bill which I believe would receive the full backing of all members of this Parliament. In closing, can I thank all organisations which sent us a briefing on this bill? And can I also note that the, the Health Minister has received a request from the Director of the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, to the possibility of delaying this legislation. I certainly, for one, would not agree with this request. Carry on, Minister, with a bill that I fully support. But I'm sure that the Health Minister will take the opportunity in his summing up hopefully, to tell this chamber how he has responded to the letter sent to him by RCN. Many thanks. Now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. For a number of years, there has been a concerted effort in both Scotland and the UK to give care recipients greater power and influence over decisions that have a direct and tangible effect on their everyday lives. This has been accompanied by attempts at both a local and national level to tailor individual care to personal specifications. The general principles of this bill, involvement, informed choice and collaboration, attempt to reconcile these two objectives in relation to social care. The aim of the bill is to ensure that service users are engaged partners as opposed to passive recipients in the commissioning and delivery of care. As a passionate advocate of independent living, I fully support this aim. However, as the Health and Sport Committee report has already highlighted, there remain aspects of the bill which must be addressed. Firstly, although the bill in its current form promotes independent living, I would like to see that strengthened by the inclusion of a statement of intent underpinning a common right to live an independent life. And to ensure that this right becomes a reality, we must continue to work towards the integration of health and social care. This is an explicit aim of the Government and one that the Labour Party supports. That is why we have called for the creation of a national care service which we believe is the best route to achieving this. However, at present, that isn't on the agenda, and we must therefore focus on the other obstacles that we must overcome. The first and foremost of these is cost. We are agreed that, where possible, individuals currently cared for in hospital should be cared for in the community. The self-directed support bill is part of this process. However, the transition of care necessitates a transition of budget. Significant bridging finance is needed to shift the cultural balance from hospital to home-based care. Does this bill make adequate financial provision for the increased numbers who will be receiving care in their own home, as is their right? At present, it seems doubtful. This is precisely the sort of detail we must have regard to if we are to ensure that the spirit of this bill is matched by its outcome. Two seconds. And I would welcome any assurances that the government can give me on that point. Bob Doris. I really appreciate the member giving away. The convener, Duncan McNeill, of the committee has, has already made clear one of the reasons there is uncertainty in relation to the finances behind this bill is the Scottish Government has quite clearly stated what it believes it will cost and it showed the workings for how it arrives at that figure. COSLA have just made broad assumptions and won't actually show with the Health and Sport Committee how it reaches its figure. Do you agree that's unsatisfactory from COSLA? Siobhan, I think all information should have been provided to the committee to make an informed choice and that's what I call on, on both sides um, to be able to make that. Um, while strategy access to self-directed support is undoubtedly empowering, it must also be may also be intimidating. Individual care requirements will vary a great deal in their nature and complexity. It is imperative, therefore, that the options available are promoted clearly and consistently across local authority boundaries. 
Not only will this enable individual service users to make an informed choice, it will help to ensure a constant high standard of care is maintained across the country. This is especially so when it comes to direct payments. Taking sole responsibility for commissioning one's own care is a daunting prospect. In many cases, this will entail the removal of the local authority as the traditional middleman in the provision of care. However, local authorities must remain part of the process with the statutory obligation to ensure that the appropriate advice and support is available prior to the allocation of a direct payment. Service users that choose this path should have access to budget management training and must be made aware of their rights and responsibilities as employers. In addition to this, the Bill must make provision for any, for any incidental costs arising from direct payments. Capability Scotland cite examples of cases in which direct payments have been discontinued immediately upon the death or long-term hospitalisation of the recipient, leaving families liable for redundancy payments owed to personal assistance. This Bill must stipulate that the amount of the award is commensurate to the overall cost of care, including those arising from sudden death or hospitalisation. And another matter of note um, is that the Bill will, in effect, create a market in the provision of care, placing local authorities and other service providers in direct competition. Some have argued that many local authorities offer less in direct payments than the equivalent cost of arranged services and attempt to keep service provision in-house. As a consequence, it has been suggested that primary responsibility for setting the value of direct payments be passed to an independent arbiter. In addition to this, Capability Scotland have argued for the establishment of an independent statutory appeals process to allow for decisions on the assessment of needs and the cost of care packages to be effectively challenged. This seems a sensible request. The formation of an independent appeals panel would offset the fears of many service users that challenging decisions through existing internal mechanisms will result in prejudicial treatment in the future. As self-directed support becomes more established, there is likely to be an increased uptake in direct payments. Whilst this will in itself be a positive development, it may lead to more use of personal assistance as opposed to service providers. In 2011, 39% of direct payments involved the use of personal assistance, with 34% using service providers and 3% some combination of two. Personal assistance are not regulated and little is known about the PA workforce. In order to guarantee a consistent high level of care to service users and to safeguard the PA workforce itself, I believe that the Scottish Government should consider developing a register of all carers and personal assistants, as Bernardos has suggested, and I was disappointed to hear the Minister um, ruling this out in his opening speech. Inclusion on this list should, should be made a precondition of funding, especially in the provision of care for children and young people. Finally, it is absolutely imperative that the provisions of this Bill are implemented. There should be a robust oversight to ensure local authority compliance, as we cannot allow any party to fail in their obligations. There is too much dormant legislation on the statute book. Self-directed support must not be allowed to join it. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Independent living is defined by the government as disabled people of all ages having the same freedom, choice, dignity and control as other citizens at home, at work and in the community. It does not mean living by yourself or fending for yourself. It means rights to practical assistance and support to participate in society and to live a normal life. What does independence mean to you? I believe that it is enshrined in the aforementioned, aforementioned government statement. Imagine having the same choice as a non-disabled person and the freedom to make that choice. Imagine doing the same things as your friends and, 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 do, and not having to sit on the sidelines. Imagine taking part in civic society, in a workplace, in a recreational activity without the stigma or barriers that can so often stop people literally in their tracks. Imagine being empowered to not just take control, but to actually be in control when much of your life is in other people's hands. Imagine the dignity of not just being consulted, but respected in the choices that you make for yourself without fear or favour, safe in the knowledge that the choices you make for yourself are yours to own, to decide, to control. These are the things that non-disabled people take for granted. We cannot imagine how difficult life can be in some respects, and we cannot imagine as non-disabled non people understand the sense of liberation a person has when they take control and ownership of their life. Imagine how you would feel as a young person trying to make your way in the world, to keep up with your friends, to keep up with your siblings. The story I'm about to tell you, presiding officer, illustrates why this needs underpinning legislation. I have the permission of the people involved, but I will maintain their confidentiality in this debate. This is a story as told to me by a father, his words and his experiences, and I quote, 
We first heard about self-directed support via parents at the Scottish Spina Bifida Association. And we thought it would be great for my child, with the outcome being that mum gets some respite and my child's care needs are being addressed, including personalisation, social, socialising and learning skills, social skills, independence skills, um, for her to learn them independently without her mum. The perfect all-in-one package, he described it as. What we did not realise is that we were entering a minefield of events that would have us unnecessarily stressed, resulting in submitting complaints to the local authority to fight for our rights and receive what we were entitled to. Our first appointment with the local social worker was within six weeks of expressing our interest in self-directed support. The meeting went well. We explained that we were interested in self-directed support and the outcome for my child would be care needs being addressed, along with independence, personalisation, socialisation and learning social skills independent independently while her mum has some respite. The social worker went away with her request to report back to her team leader. A few weeks pass and we received a call to arrange a follow-up appointment. On arrival, the social worker asked similar questions to the first meeting and we were confused and said that it was self-directed support that we were looking for for my child. The social worker, in surprise, looked at us and asked for more information. And so once again, we explained why we wanted the self-directed support. She went back to report to her team leader. A few weeks passed and we received another call to arrange a follow-up appointment. On arrival, the social worker asked similar questions at the first and second meeting. We were very confused and I asked if she was having a laugh, as we had spent the last two appointments just discussing this. At this point, the social worker admitted that our team leader was unaware of the details of self-directed support. I asked that if I did not quiz her, then we'd be having a coffee in another few weeks' time to talk about self-directed support. Talk about deja vu. We gave the social worker in-house contact details within the local authority to request a process of self-directed support. A few weeks passed again and we received a call to arrange another follow-up appointment. On arrival, the social worker smiled and the assessment began all over again. A few weeks subsequently further passed and we were informed that there was no money in the budget to pay for self-directed support, which would be revised at the next financial year. And now the complaint started. We arranged meetings with social workers, team leaders, people at Scottish Personal Assistance Employees Network, Christina McKelvey MSP, the Head of Adult and Older Services, the Executive Director of Social Work in South Lanarkshire Council, resulting in my child being awarded two days, two hours per week, which was awarded from another budget, as there was no money left in the children's budget, even though the Scottish Government had awarded South Lanarkshire Council with £600,000 every year for the next three years, £1.8 million swallowed into other budgets. The social worker then gave, a, gave us verbally permission to arrange a personal assistant for my child as the first payment would be processed at the month's end. Lesson number one, take nothing verbal from a social worker as my child's first payment took three months and was not backdated. So we, who, would, who would have to pay the wages if we, hadn't managed to, if we had managed to find an appropriate personal assistant for my child? A few weeks later, we received an email from the social worker and team leader requesting for more information. Remember that I've taken everything to every meeting previously, which may now result in monies being paid back. Six months later, my child's first review is still waiting to be heard. This will leave the matter of respite for mum not dealt with, with her having caring duties for my child's twin sister, who is now recognised as a young carer. We have requested a review to receive an extra hours for respite on a weekly basis to support mum. Six months later, we are still waiting. Presiding officer, there is nothing more powerful than the experience of someone trying to navigate a system which does not have legislative backing. For that reason alone, I welcome the plans to legislate and hopefully families won't have to experience the experience I've detailed today. And can I ask the Minister to pay particular attention to the needs of children during the process of this bill? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin Lee MacArthur to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join with others in congratulating uh, Duncan McNeill and his colleagues on the Health and Sport Committee on the uh, production of this uh, very, uh, uh, very thorough report? Uh, I'm also happy to confirm the Liberal Democrats' support uh, for the bill, like others. Um, uh, perhaps it's overdue, but we certainly think it represents an important step in giving adults and children, carers and young carers, more control over how their social care needs are met. While the idea of self-directed support is increasingly prevalent, there is still a lack of consistency in what uh, options are available and where. 
the headline figure comparing direct payments, for example, in England and Scotland is stark, and the Christie Commission was right to highlight that further action is needed to increase uh, uptake of self-directed su support. In that respect, I certainly welcome uh, the government's intentions behind this bill, enshrining into law a requirement for all local authorities to offer four distinct options for people with support needs. Receiving direct payments, uh, directing uh, the available resources, having the local authority arrange support, or a combination of uh, all three. I think this is a significant step in the right direction. Hopefully it will help ensure that everyone is able uh, to make the choice that best fits their own circumstances. Uh, I understand questions have been raised in committee about how this new duty will be implemented. There will certainly be challenges uh, for local authorities and providers in adapting to what will inevitably be changing demands for certain services and providers will no doubt be wary of the cost uh, implications. We've heard some of that from Siobhan McMahon, Duncan McNeill and others. The coalition of care and support providers in Scotland highlight, for example, that, quote, high demand for out-of-hours care and flexible care could mean a more expensive uh, workforce. As I indicated to the Minister earlier on, there are specific uh, issues in relation to Orkney, a, a small uh, rural island-based uh, community where there's certainly demand for more uh, self-directed uh, support, but often the scope for making savings in the provision of other services is considerably limited. That's been our experience uh, to date, and we hope the Minister would uh, reflect on those specific challenges um, uh, facing uh, Orkney, probably Shetland and Western Isles, as well. We have to ensure that providers are able to meet the demands that self-directed support may place on them. Key here is maintaining not only levels of funding but also transparency. A number of groups have raised concerns that implementing self-directed support must not be used as a cost-cutting exercise, and I certainly welcome the very strong statement from the Minister in his opening remarks. Uh, there are examples that have been cited, I think Bob Doris and Duncan McNeil both uh, referred to the situation in Glasgow, and I think that does offer a bit of a cautionary tale. The Government uh, need to ensure that implementing self-directed support, that sufficient funding is in place and that it's clear where the money is going. I also welcome the requirement for local authorities to ensure that individuals are able to make an informed choice about the option that will best meet their needs. However, concerns have been raised with me about the omission from the Bill of the Right to access independent advocacy. I know from uh, my own experience in, in Orkney that advocacy services are vital in helping people, particularly vulnerable people, uh, make informed choices and their support calls for a right to access independent advocacy to be included in this Bill. Turning briefly to the second aspect of uh, the legislation, it's equally important that as well as putting in place better options for people with support needs, we also make sure that their carers have full access to the help that they need. As it stands, the bill will give local authorities the option of providing support ser services to carers as well. At stage one, the committee heard a great deal over the nature of this section, particularly about the fact that it does not impose a duty on local authorities. Carers Scotland argue that, quote, enacting the legislation simply as a power will result in inequity with significant variances in practice and thus support for carers across local authorities. Further, there are readily identifiable benefits to having proper levels of support in place uh, universally. And I quote, providing support at the right time can also prevent carers from having to give up paid employment and activities that sustain their life outside caring, resulting in negative com consequences for their finances, health, and well-being. Although I acknowledge concerns that placing a duty on local authorities could lead to uh, strict eligibility criteria, I still believe that the argument for such a duty has much to commend it. Many carers have worried about this bill as it stands uh, will not deliver the necessary improvements for them and I would invite the Minister to reflect further on the evidence presented to the committee on this, on this section ahead of uh, stage two of the bill. Further concern, particularly relevant for young carers, is over the potential impact that the need to manage self-directed support bu budgets might have on them. The possibility that carers could end up having to manage personal budgets for family members on top of the current caring responsibilities would be a potentially unwanted uh, burden. I think various members have highlighted the views of uh, Bernardo Scotland, uh, who advocate the introduction of training and uh, support for budget holders, a suggestion that I think certainly warrants further uh, consideration. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, the prospect that the bill may open up the possibility that uh, unpaid carers could be charged for services which help support them in their caring role is one uh, I think needs to be addressed. Clearly, uh, that would not be welcome, and I ask uh, the Minister to, to look to perhaps clarify uh, the situation. As we've heard today, while the principles of this bill are indeed uh, very sound, there remain a number of details that still need to be dealt with. I think the Minister's touched on a number of those in his opening remarks. I hope he'll return 
to a few more of them in, uh, in closing this afternoon. So that going forward, we can be confident not only that this bill will be implemented successfully and smoothly to help people with support needs manage their own care, but that it will also bring with it meaningful change for carers. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Liberal Democrats will be uh, only too happy to uh, vote in support of the general principles of the bill uh, this evening, and we look forward to working with the government, uh, with other parties and those out with this chamber uh, to improve and strengthen it as it progresses through its various stages. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Mary Fee. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like others uh, in this debate, can I thank all the various agencies that have provided information uh, for this debate this afternoon. Uh, it wasn't my intention, Presiding Officer, to stand up and uh, defend social work. But I think after hearing Christina McKelvey's uh, story, which is very real, um, as a former social worker, team leader and service manager, I think is a failure in process. And that highlights something essential, I think, in this bill. It's not about process, it's about people. Here, here. It's about enabling. This bill is about an enablement. It's about enabling people to make choice. But, presiding officer, you cannot make choice or the right choice if you don't have the information. And the information to enable choice has to be free of bias. It has to be there to reflect the need of the individual and their family and carers. Presiding officer, in my 30 odd years in social care, I met many families with many different needs. But the principle of doing the assessment to identify that need must not and should not ever be resource driven. It is outcome based. We have to divorce what resources are available to ensure that we provide an assessment free of that information. We've got to ensure that when we carry out an assessment, we're assessing the need of that individual and or their carers at that time. We have to come up with an informed care package, not one that's decided for them, as I think Dr. McNeil uh, eloquently said. It's not what we do to people, it's what we do with and for. Presiding officer, a care package and establishing their need is a joint partnership. It's establishing what the person needs and at what time they need it. There are many good examples and we've had many case studies during this briefing for this debate, presiding officer. And I can take you back to uh, uh, a case of my own many years ago when I was practicing in social work. And it was a young, young lad in Inverclyde in my early days in social work. And he had very limited communication skills, no speech. But he was able to smile and he was able to laugh. And unbeknown to me, when I walked into the room to come and see the family, Apparently, his eyes used to light up because I used to sit beside him and he would just hold my hand. And he, he got immense pleasure from that very basic contact, presiding officer. And that's the, the principle behind this bill. It's about actually identifying what the basic needs are. It's not complex. It's actually identifying what the basic needs are. It's about ensuring dignity. It's about ensuring respect. And, presiding officer, we cannot lose sight of that. I remember on an occasion for myself actually achieving an independence, and that was to be able to open up a computer and use it through screen reading technology. That gave me the ability to actually do things for myself rather than be dependent on others. Now, fortunately for my wife, the screen reader does not read the bank statements and I have absolutely no idea whatsoever <laughs> that presiding officer, seriously, seriously, presiding officer, it is about, if it's independent living, it's not about living on your own. It's about living with the appropriate supports. None of us, presiding officer, tend to live in isolation. We live with support from others, whether it's through partnership, marriage, 
whether of its colleagues and support in your profession. We are interdependent, just at different levels. And we need to respect that and identify that and, and associate that the need of the person must be met. And as I said before, as long as it's not resource-led and it has to be output-led. And we have to meet that need in the best way that we can. We've heard much about carers, presiding officer. And I welcome the fact that this parliament will be holding its first carers parliament in the 1st of October. Carers will be coming together in this chamber to hear, so we could hear their voice. Presiding officer, that is a step forward for this parliament. That is a step forward for our communities. That is a step forward for our carers. I endorse the work that the government has done so far in this bill, and I endorse the support it's had from this chamber. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Now call on Mary Fee to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome the chance to take part in today's debate, given the concerns that I've shared with this chamber in previous debates relating to care. Like my colleagues on these benches, I welcome this bill and the general principles enshrined within it. The hope must be, and I'm sure that it is, that creating this legislation will increase the uptake of direct payments, which have slowly increased over the last decade. It's also welcoming how supportive carers groups, service users and trade unions have been towards the bill, and how involved each has been with the committee through the process of evidence gathering. With changes to be proposed after this stage, one amendment that I do feel is needed is for the bill to include a right of access to independent advocacy. In his response to the Committee on Independent Advocacy, Michael Matheson said that the bill will place a duty on local authorities to give people information and advice about the decisions that they make and point them in the direct direction of independent advocacies. I take a slightly different view from the Minister on this, and I feel that local authorities will not have the impartiality that independent advocacies can offer from the outset. If I have time later on, I will, but I'm really tight and I've got a lot I want to get in. Independent advocacy person Ken Ross said in their submission that they had concerns regarding the quality of information provided to people making decisions around whether they should use this method of personalising their care. In some instances, it was noted that the person had not always been made aware of the responsibilities connected with direct payments, and they had only been informed of the benefits. And for this legislation to work, service users and carers must know all the aspects of what they are taking on. Presiding officer, over the last year, much has been discussed about carers and the carer strategy. We all appreciate the important role that carers contribute, and now would be the best opportunity to give something back by placing a duty to offer carers self-directed support instead of a power. Carer Scotland, through their submission to the committee, pointed out that a power will result in significant variances in practice and across local authorities. They continued to add, by legislating for a statutory duty rather than simply a power, this bill presents an opportunity to deliver a limited right to some practical support subject to assess need. Placing a duty will give some carers back their normality, let them be themselves again, and ensures that their own health and well-being is paramount. I listened with interest earlier to the Minister's comments about PAs. And while I, I, I accept the use of personal um, assistance has decreased in recent years, I still have concerns around their training, their qualification and the monitoring of PAs. In fact, some of my concerns were highlighted by others in the committee's evidence. The Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland called for some basic level of accreditation for personal assistance and as a minimum requirement that they be, be, be made subject to PVG checks. The Scottish Social Services Council added that agencies providing PAs and indeed other social service workers should be regarded as care services and required to register with the care inspectorate. The need for regulation is a safety net, not only for the service users, but for the workforce. During my time on the Health and Sport Committee, 
Many stories attracted national press coverage relating to the care of the elderly. And to make sure cases of neglect, abuse or poor provision do not occur, then regulation of PAs is a must. My second reservation, the employment of family members, also looks at how they are trained and regulated. Much of what I have said in relation to PAs can be attributed to family members. However, what is most important is that any employment of a relative must be in the best interests of the service user. With much of the unpaid care provided by family members, it is right that the restrictions are reduced. However, training and regulation must balance that reduction. Finally, presiding officer, a constituent contacted me and asked if I used the following quote in my speech today, which is very fitting, and it reflects the uncertainty carers have and the feeling towards the bill before us today. As a carer for my husband, who has a spinal injury, I find myself increasingly worried for the future. What happens when we really do need support? What hoops will we have to jump through? It took five months and four different professionals when all we wanted to do was put an emergency plan in place. We gave up and did something ourselves. The first professional we met didn't know about direct payments. So when things get worse, as they will, will we be able to get help to lift my husband, to get him to bed, support that means I can continue working? Will I have to give up a job I enjoy? Will any help in future work around our needs as a family? We don't mind paying for services which support us, but they need to work around my husband's life and let him have some dignity. Will the SDS bill enable this to happen? I watch with sadness as some of, at some of the battles my friends have had to go through to get help with caring, and I know some for whom self-directed support has been a godsend, so I want it to be easier for others to get the help they need. So my plea is to recognise that carers need their own rights, and the SDS bill provides a starting point. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on George Adam to be followed by Helen Needy. Thank you, President Officer. I too welcome this bill and the debate. Uh, I'm speaking as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, but unfortunately I can't take any credit for any of the great work that Duncan McNeill and his uh, group have made because I've only been there for two meetings. But uh, as of tonight at 5pm, there will be no more. Uh, it was that one. And in football parlance, I asked for the transfer to this committee. But uh, not only because it was the only committee I wanted to play for, but also because it is a committee with issues that are very close to my heart. From my own point of view, with my wife Stacey, with her multiple sclerosis and her ongoing struggle with that, I've seen what it's like for someone to actually be involved and have to access services as the years have passed on. But not just Stacey, because luckily she's quite lucky compared to others. I've been able to work as an elected member with other people within the area to actually see what difference a bill like this could make to their life. And I think... When you look at this and you listen to what Dennis Robertson said, it is about people, and that is the most important thing. When, when I was looking at some of the evidence that was uh, taken at the, at the committee as well, there was a dialogue between Bob Doris and a Margaret Cassidy, who was a user of uh, social work in the past, and he asked her a simple question. Margaret, your prepared statement mentions that you now do things like go dancing, go swimming, not when you're told, but go swimming at a time of your choosing. And Margaret says, yes, they told me to do these things when they wanted. And then Bob asks, I suppose I am trying to give you the opportunity to put in the record whether you thought you had enough choice previously. And Margaret says, a very interesting story, which is a perfect example of why this bill is so important. It was so-so. I will tell you a wee thing. One time I wanted milk, and the woman who was helping me said that was not her job. I was only asking for a pint of milk, but she said, by the way, that's not my job. I said to her, what is your job? We had a falling out. I told her, there's the door, don't come back. And I think this bill actually gives people like Margaret the actual power to do that to the extent of being in control of their own lives as well. And I think that's an important point to take on board. But uh, as the Minister and Duncan McNeill already said, was that this bill should be seen, should not be seen as an agenda to, for cuts, but see for the vision and independence that it offers families, families across our nation. I support the core values of the 2010 strategy of respect, fairness, independence and freedom. And I see these values in this bill. 
and uh, ensuring that supported people have independence to lead an, a fulfilled life. But it is important, as others have already said, that we actually acknowledge the 650,000 unpaired carers in Scotland. And I think you can see that the, 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 ext the, the extension of direct payments to carers is proof that the Scottish Government is acknowledging this and other investments of over 24 million in three years in direct support to carers, plus 46 million pounds is to support carers of older people because we are living in a society that is getting older. Another great addition, and it's been mentioned before, is the Carers' Parliament itself. Presiding officer, I've already booked my place and uh, look forward to the first Carers' Parliament because I think it's important that we engage in this chamber with everyone from across society. And unless we hear these stories, not just at surgeries, not just when we have appointments, but actually see it within this forum, I think it brings it back home and makes it so important that it makes this place relevant to the people that we actually serve. Because technically, this is close to my heart, because I am technically a carer, uh, although my wife might uh, say otherwise, uh, but technically I care for my wife. I'm lucky because I have my mother and father-in-law's help and support, and they ensure that without their support, I wouldn't be able to do the job and the work that I do as well. But the point we must remember is that I have that support. There's families and other families who need further support. And we must never forget the contribution, contribution these 650,000 unpaid carers make. So we must strive to provide as much support as possible. And that is one of the reasons why I support the bill. The most important uh, choice that the, the bill offers is the choice itself, direct payments. I would like to see a uh, minister, presiding officer, I would like the minister to look at the potential of the process of the application of direct payments being a wee bit easier at local authority level because I know from various uh, cases I have myself that things can be quite difficult and take a long time to go through. But people who have taken this ideal have done extremely well and enjoyed it. But you'll still have the traditional local authority arranged service, uh, directly available budget and a combination, of, a combination of eligible options. I'm particularly looking forward to the clarity of existing laws and direct payments as it's been somewhat of a mishmash and haphazard at present. And uh, I welcome the flexibility with regard to family members and direct payment that the Minister uh, spoke about as well. I think it's something we have to look at because as is a natural process, families are always the ones that tend to look after uh, individuals. But in closing, presiding officer, I would like to add my voice to support of this bill. It does carry forward the legacy of the Christie Commission and also ensures practical support for people and families throughout Scotland. I've already mentioned Scotland's 650,000 unpaid carers and their contribution to our communities. They and their families must be supported and ensure a quality, independent life. This, presiding officer, is a strong bill, and I agree with the minister when he says this can make a difference to people's lives throughout Scotland. Thanks very much. Now I call on Helen Eady to be followed by Fiona MacLeod, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and I echo the views of others in this chamber in welcoming the legislation, particularly Malcolm Chisholm, in supporting option two, where the individual chooses and the local authority provides. I really don't like the notion or the spectre of individuals uh, hiring and firing at their will, as is the Tory proposition coming down the line at us. I bring with me experience as a carer of my parents, and I have watched the tender, loving care of my stepmother-in-law before the death of my father-in-law, and he needed care in home for almost two years, and that was uh, quite a traumatic experience for her, and we watched that experience and did what we could to support. I also bring with me the experience of 13 years as a councillor in Fife and a long-time member of the Social Work Committee. And when I first joined the council, home helps were provided free of charge by the Labour Administration. And home helps in those days did everything that they were called upon to do. And times have now changed and we have now moved to a situation where that service was free when I first joined the council. And to the time last year when the SNP lost control it had in Fife, the charges had reached £11 per hour for those not on benefit, quite unsustainable for those individuals who need to have the care that is desperate for them. And my work as an MSP has helped to underline just the myriad of issues that come before you as a parliamentarian 
and the caseload um, that that presents to us. And I have read with interest uh, very much of what has been uh, said before us today and I, I have been really uh, fascinated to see the proposals coming before us because I remember when I cared for my parents uh, 20 years, or, well, 29 years ago now, um, just before they died, uh, my parents, we had none of the support services that are now going to be in place, and I welcome that support. It's so critical for carers and for uh, the individuals. But given the time to me is so short, I shall dwell on the representations made to me uh, by Capabilities Scotland, and which have been mentioned by others. And I won't go into uh, any more detail other than to say that I was compelled by their point about the establishment of, the non of, of a new tribunal jurisdiction because of the recent case law from the European Court of Human Rights, where it suggested that even cumulatively, these mechanisms do not amount to an independent and impartial tribunal. They say CFI, Capability Scotland, after extensive consultation, the Scottish Committee of the Administrative Justice and Tribunals this month recommended the establishment of a new tribunal jurisdiction to deal with the appeals against uh, community care decisions and I do hope that the Minister will listen very carefully to what uh, Carers Scotland have said and uh, uh, Capabilities Scotland have said and I think that the Minister when he spoke at the very beginning of, about having the right policy framework for carers um, and he talked at that time about a duty or a power and the point that really came over to me in the briefings that we've had today about this particular um, legislation is that we're talking about a discretionary power and I really have to say that I was very moved as always I am when I hear Dennis Robertson speak in this chamber he gave a real compelling uh, situation to us and description of what it's like uh, for the individuals concerned and that's why I think that the minister really has to think about those carers across Scotland because he has to understand that those carers will be put in a position of having to be um, at, at the mercy of every local authority's financial consideration. And that was the point that Dennis Robertson was saying should not happen. It should not be at the, the, the financial consideration. It should be at the needs of the, the particular individuals, but also those carers as well. And I think it would be a great mistake if this legislation goes through and that we don't ensure the minimum regulation of standards across the whole of Scotland because we know what a postcode lottery actually means throughout the whole of Scotland. And I also note from the briefings that carers' assessments were not common practice in all local authorities. And I note too that there have been calls to ensure the assessments were better publicised. I think that has to be a very important call. And the issues of carers complaining that the assessment processes were too long, especially when a short or small intervention was required. And I really uh, do have an issue uh, that I have to question the Minister on. And I just wonder uh, if the Minister, when he sums up, can talk about how this fits in with sheltered housing as well. Because I know that across Scotland, there have been housing, uh, sheltered housing organisations like Build, where they charge for the services that they provide. And some of that money uh, that goes towards those services, I just wonder what happens when uh, those sheltered housing organisations actually cut back on the services that provide. The individuals are still left paying for the services, but the services are cut. And that's something that in his own area um, it, that he represents is, is an issue. And indeed, it was in Fife for me in the last three years as well. And I just hope that he will address that as to whether that is affected or impacted upon in uh, the legislation. But broadly, I welcome the um, support given by all colleagues in the chamber today and welcoming this legislation. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I now call on Fiona MacLeod. Ms MacLeod, you've got six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, we, we've heard the numbers already today about the vast army of 650,000 unpaid carers across Scotland who contribute or save um, the Scottish Purse £10 billion a year in their work. I'd like to speak particularly in this bill on one large section of those unpaid carers, and that is about family carers. And when I was on the Health and Sport Committee and we were taking evidence uh, on, on the bill, 
It was very interesting when we looked at the government's decision to change from the payment of family carers under exceptional circumstances to where is appropriate. And I welcome the Minister's uh, comments on that today. But when we were taking evidence, it was very interesting to see the very sharp divide on this question. And it was perhaps reflected today as well in the speech by Gil Patterson, talking about undue influence and coercion by family members if they became paid carers. When we received evidence, it was very clear that it was councils and people like the Association of the Directors of Social Work who illogically talked about the right of everybody who receives care to choose the care that they, they thought best, but who then said that we had to keep in place the exceptional circumstances uh, criteria for paying family members through direct payments. And then if you contrast that with people like the carers organisations, um, Age Scotland, where you find that in their evidence they talk about the fact that most unpaid care is actually done by family members and that those family members when they are able to provide the care it leads to better outcomes for the person receiving care so in reflecting on the dichotomy and the, the evidence that we received on this um, topic i thought i would like to um, take the the members of the chamber today on a personal journey for nigh on 23 years, I've been a family carer. And you start that when it happens to you by just think, I just thought I was being a good daughter. I was just doing the things that my mum needed me to do. But it escalates over the years and you end up doing the banking and the bills. You end up doing the messages. It's, um, and if my mum said, I want a pint of milk, I went and got the pint of milk. You then, it escalates. You're taking them to health appointments you're doing emergency hospital admissions. At work, you're receiving phone calls perhaps four and five times a day when the person, you, the family person, the member you're caring for isn't coping. And there comes a point when there's a realisation you think, we need a care package here. This is not something that I'm doing well. So you set off on that route, but very quickly you learn the limitations of the care packages that are on uh, offer at the moment through local councils. The four times a day, 15-minute visit, inadequate for anything, not just for not cooking meals, but for even giving company to somebody. I certainly will. Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank uh, Fiona uh, McClough for taking the intervention. Does that mean then that the council is, is doing resource-led interventions and assessments rather than needs-led? Fiona McLeod. I think, as, as Dennis has said in his intervention and in his earlier contribution, that's exactly what happens. And that's why having the, the, care, the person getting care, having the control through direct payment, means that they'll be choosing the care that they need and not the one that a council says is what their resource limitations will allow them to provide. I had some other examples on the limitations, but let me just take you to the next step, which was the next realisation, was that those care packages don't work and that what they provide is certainly not support for independent living in the community. And all that time that the care package is in place, the family carer is still doing all the jobs such as paying the bills, doing the messages, taking the, the, the cared person to hospital. So it was at that realisation you say, how do we get a personal service? found out about direct payments, you have to know the system. Dennis Robertson has explained that. And can I just give you a little anecdote? My son said to me once, it feels like you're having to beat the system, Mum, exactly as Christina McKelvey explained that her, her um, constituents had, be, had gone through. And as my son said as well, Mum, you used to be an MSP. If you can't beat the system, how does anybody else manage? But you do get your direct payment. And it's so important that that preferred choice of it being your family member who has been giving you your care will now no longer be considered under exceptional circumstances. But when a person needs care, gets a direct payment 
and chooses that it is their family member who has been giving them their care, who is the most appropriate person to give them that care, that they should be able to use that direct payment to employ that family member. And can I just finish by talking about the toll that it takes on the family carer going through all that hoops and processes, etc., under exceptional circumstances. You end up as a carer thinking not that you're a good daughter, but that you're a bad carer. So please support this legislation and the move to appropriate circumstances. Thank you. We move to the wind-up speeches. I call Jackson Carlow. Mr Carlow, you've got six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I say for those in the chamber who were in the last parliament, this is going to be my Jamie Stone uh, summation, in as much as I am tempted to say I agree with everything everybody has said largely and sit down, but I think that might be unhelpful to you, Presiding Officer. So I'd like to touch on some of the themes that I, I think emerged during the course of the debate. Can I begin actually by thanking the Minister um, for his pre-legislative uh, courtesy in entering into discussions with Nanette Milne, myself and I'm sure with others. I was certainly not in any doubt um, about his own personal sincerity about the legislation that the government are bringing forward. It's a subject about which he spoke before he was a minister himself, and I think it's clearly something that he himself wishes to see progressed and understands very well the benefits that will come from the legislation succeeding. And he said the overall purpose of this legislation is to make a difference to those in society in need of support. And I thought what was interesting really was his response to the Health and Sport Committee, which Mr McNeill then went on to detail, and I thought a very fine speech, which was uh, characterised by its illustration of the personal examples that I think had moved him and the committee during the course of the evidence that they took. I, he was too quick with Omar's surname for me to get that scribbled down, so I've only got Omar mentioned several times. But it was clear through him and others uh, that the difference that could be made, particularly uh, the direct payment to personal assistant in his case, uh, can make. Uh, I thought what was interesting was the strength and resonance of the appeal he felt from Pam Duncan and respective independent living against prescription uh, to ensure that as many people as possible as a result of this legislation have a chance to plot their own lives. But I thought Mr McNeill identified a conundrum which worries me uh, in this legislation. And I suppose it worries me a little bit as we go forward to the health and social care bill as well, and that is it's actually going to be very easy for us in this chamber uh, to agree that we understand and approve of the principles of these measures. It's going to be much harder, I think, for our understanding and support for the principles to translate into the successful introduction and implementation of what we are seeking to achieve if there are forces elsewhere who are not wholly committed to the process, because we know that in previous examples, whether it be community health here, partnerships or whatever else, that that can un be unhelpful in terms of progressing the measure in question. And I thought when Mr McNeill talked about the inability of COSLA to come forward with their own detailed costings while challenging the government was extremely unhelpful because I would imagine the government would actually welcome anybody else's alternative suggestion in order that they can robustly test whether in their own minds the assessment they've made of the cost itself is correct. Um, you know, bills like this, some bills will get a second chance in the public mind. This is one of those bills that won't. The perception of whether or not this bill as a, an enacted measure has succeeded will be whether or not people at the start feel that they can trust the legislation that has been implemented and it meets the challenge that it seeks to address. Um, Jackie Bailey, I think, welcomed the legislation warmly. She made some pertinent points when she said that she was supporting on, on the basis that it extends choice. This, of course, was a principle hitherto unknown to me in the Labour Party, but I took it at face value uh, and welcomed it nonetheless. But she touched upon the independent advocacy that Mary Fee returned to uh, and the appeals process that several members returned to. Gil Patterson, I thought, touched quite directly on what was a difficult area to discuss, and that was the involvement of family members in the personal assistant role. And I think in a gentle and sensitive way made the point that, as the minister has said, it needs to be determined that there is an appropriate involvement 
uh, and that the circumstances and criteria are appropriate without necessarily ending up with something which becomes difficult and obstructive in terms of uh, making sure that we exercise the individual's uh, first choice. Malcolm Chisholm, I think, alarmed us all with his Twitter conversation with not the minister, not Miss Cunningham, but Rosanna, I think he said, which uh, was really very, I mean, here was me thinking, I was quite jealous. I thought I had the perfect working relationship with the previous health secretary, the cabinet secretary, Miss Sturgeon. I never got any more familiar than that. But I think that the point that he was making actually comes back to the point I was trying to suggest a moment ago that there's an awful lot of detail here, and unless the detail is properly understood and worked out, then there is a capacity for us to trip over the legislation as it's implemented and frustrate what it is we're trying to achieve. Similarly, Siobhan McMahon would probably be a bit worried that both she and the Conservatives and the SNP are all similarly minded to progress in all of this. Normally, she would only follow me if I was walking towards a hole in the ground, but... <laughs> On this, in this instance, I think we are agreed as a parliament that we support the general principles of this bill and want to see it succeed. And Christine McKelvey, Dennis Robertson and Fiona McLeod and George Adam all actually then used personal uh, experience to illustrate the point that they were making. Uh, and I think this was one of the points that struck me latterly, how common an association on a personal level with self-directed support, with care, uh, the ordinary experience is. People in this chamber, just as people outside of this chamber, have a first-hand experience of the subject at hand and understand the difficulties and the obstacles that need to be overcome. Scotland and the United... Now, Mr. I will. Scotland and the United... Well, I'll just close on that point and say that we welcome and support the general principles of the bill and look forward to the discussion that takes place as we go forward. <laughs> I now call on Drew Smith. Mr Smith, you've got seven minutes. Thank you, officer. As another member of the Health and Sport Committee, I would also associate myself with the remarks others have made about the Clarking team, um, and as Jackson Carlaw did pay tribute to Duncan McNeill for the powerful way in which he set out the approach of the committee, uh, that the approach that the committee took uh, in examining this bill. In opening this debate for the Scottish Labour Party, Jackie Bailey made clear our support for the Social Care Self-Directed Support Bill at Stage 1. If the purpose of this bill is to provide a framework uh, for a more personalised system of social care, independent living, or as Richard Lyle would have it, freedom, then the key point that Parliament should understand is, that, is what level of service, personalisation service users are able to direct already. And I thought that Christina McKelvey, Liam MacArthur and Mary Fee um, made clear that despite personalisation being a long-held objective of this Parliament, the situation across the country very clearly continues to vary enormously. Variation in the actual services which people choose to make use of is no bad thing, and indeed creating more flexible services which are better tailored around the needs of individuals is the goal of this proposed legislation. Scottish Labour sh shares the government's belief that the problem in this, uh, is then in this respect that it's not too much variation in individual care packages, but rather too much variation in the degree of choice and control which individuals exercise over their own care or support. In the case of those who may also require a degree of support to meaningfully exercise choice and control, the chances of real self-direction is often slim. The government have set out in this bill a description of what a budget for self-directed support could be used for. By enshrining a right to self-directed support in law, Parliament is providing users of social care with a menu of options, four options, um, I, which were set out by the Minister Richard Lyle, Duncan McNeil um, and others, and I won't repeat them. But the committee heard and indeed proactively found a number of examples of how such an approach or components of that approach is already working in different parts of Scotland. However, par Parliament should be clear that while increasing direct payments, which I don't think we should forget have actually been a feature of our social care system for longer than this Parliament has actually been in existence, should necessarily be the only or most important goal of self-directed support. Direct payments should not be the only, increasing direct payments should not be seen as the only measure of success or the sole indicator of systemic change. Changes in the process of selecting and ultimately procuring social care will not in and of itself lead to an improvement in the standards of social care provided or a better experience for those who are assessed as requiring support. At a time of significant change in the welfare system and budgetary pressures in local authorities, uh, as members have said across the chamber, there is a considerable risk that some will see SDS as an opportunity not to drive up quality, but rather of cutting costs. 
Malcolm Chisholm pointed out that the bill comes in advance of changes needed to ensure adequate integration of health and social care. And again, this presents a significant risk to the legislation achieving the government's intended effects. Scottish Labour continues to believe that the most urgent changes needed in social care is improvement in quality with, yes, an emphasis on respect for choice and control, but also respect for human dignity and fairness around Scotland. To deliver this, Labour continues to believe in a more radical shift towards a national care service based on local delivery and control, but with minimum standards of care to end the postcode lottery, as Jackie Bailey set out. And we do look forward to the Minister's continuing discussions with COSLA to ensure that postcode charging um, does become a thing of the past. Members have highlighted a number of other areas of concern, um, such as uh, Siobhan McMahon, who talked about um, the, uh, a greater, the greater focus that is required on how direct payments will be ended when the need for them has passed. Uh, there also remain further questions around whether the regulation of those employed through direct payments is all that it should be. Support for carers is spent to save, and there will continue to be questions about whether we are getting the balance of support to carers and the desire to put the cared for at the heart of the new, new regime. Equally, the appropriate role often for family members in a system which puts greater emphasis on individuals making their own choices and controlling their own budgets is something which I suspect Parliament will return to, whether this bill passes in its current form or not. And I would hope that the front bench will continue um, to have regard to the comments of both Gil Parkinson and Fiona McLeod in this regard. The interests of those who work in the care sector should also be considered, as should the regulation of those workers, such as particularly PAs. And I suppose if I was to have any particular reflection as a member of the committee, um, would be that it, it perhaps would have been useful to hear more direct evidence from those individuals who work in the care sector directly um, through oral evidence. I know that we did receive um, written evidence on the point. President officer, the final and most substantial con concern that I wish to briefly reflect on is the call for an enshrined right to advocacy. As well as a right to make choices and exercise control, service users who may, need, who may need it also have a right to the appropriate level of support. As I said at the beginning of my contribution, um, that is required to make their choices and control meaningful. Of course. Fiona McLeod. Mr Smith's attention to section 13 A and B where it clearly says a person must be provided with any assistance that is reasonably required to enable the person to express their views and make an informed choice. Is that not advocacy? Drew Smith? Um, I, I think the point was perhaps um, made by um, Mary Fee in her contribution earlier when she um, talked about the relationship of trust that exists between those who rely on care and those who provide care. And I think then that the key word becomes independent in respect of advocacy. Um, the ab ability of individuals um, to uh, make choices will be heavily influenced by the resource or not allocated to them as a result of a needs assessment. So it is imperative that this is done properly with the aid of advocacy if required and also a system of review. Um, the government's uh, working group uh, on the issue of appeals and review is welcome. Um, but as Duncan McNeill argued, it is vital that the government is mindful of the evidence heard by the committee that a complaints procedure is not a substitute for an appeals process uh, and assessments should be carried out properly in a way which can be monitored and challenged through a review process, which recognises that circumstances not only change but can also be misunderstood. The Health and Sport Committee at Stage 1 makes clear as uh, this debate uh, has that the changes contained in the bill present significant challenges for both service users and service providers. And it's a view of the Scottish Labour Party in common, in common with the Independent Advocacy Alliance and many other organisations um, that support should include making independent advocacy available by right and ensuring proper funding is available to local authorities to successfully promote and deliver self-directed support. In supporting this bill at stage one, presiding officer, I don't quite echo Richard Lyle's call of carry on minister. But Scottish Labour does urge the Scottish Government to ensure that the best possible system of support is created to effectively deliver the changes which Ministers are seeking to make. I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. I would be obliged, Minister, if you would continue until 4.58. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has um, been a very good debate and there have been a range of contributions from across the chamber. 
where in Jackson Callow and his uh, remarks made reference to the way in which a number of individuals have used their own personal experience, that direct experience, and how it's helped to shape their views around the whole agenda of personalisation of care and also self-directed support. And the case that Duncan McNeill set out with was uh, Omar when he gave uh, evidence to the uh, Health and Sport Committee. Uh, terms such as flexibility, uh, uh, race, his ambitions. And from the individuals that I've met with across the country who have benefited from self-directed support, these are very consistent types of traits that people benefit from uh, this particular uh, use of self-directed support. And it's that type of flexibility that self-directed support provides that addresses the very type of difficulty that Jackie Bailey highlighted around issues of choice about when you have a tuck in service. Should a tuck in service come in at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock? We know Jackson Carlow goes to bed early, <laughs> but I'm assured he also rises early. But I'm, I, it's a type of issue that I think illustrates some of the small issues that can often be forgotten that have a real impact on the quality of someone's life that self-directed support can assist us in addressing. And as Pam Duncan also said in her contribution to the committee about the need to make sure we focus on the issue of empowerment and the way in which that can empower someone to lead an independent life. Now, Lynette Millen in her contribution made reference to the low uptake in direct payments and the variation across different local authorities. And direct payments have been in place for several decades now. On average, it's around 3 or 4% uh, of people who will make use of a direct payment. There have been an there's been an increase in, the, in recent years, but not the sort of sustained increase to the level that you would expect. Which raises the question as to why is that the case? Now, I know that some local authorities do actively dissuade people from looking at the issue of direct payments. Ah, we don't do that here, uh, but the neighbouring local authority happens to provide it. Or... It can also be the issue that people are anxious about the implications that come from employing someone directly yourself and the responsibility that then goes with employing a member of staff to meet your own care needs as well. And that's why in the four options that we have set out in the bill that Malcolm Chisholm made reference to, the four options are drafted in such a way as to try and maximise opportunity for individuals to have much greater control over their own personal care whether they want a direct payment, whether they want to direct the way in which the resource is used by the local authority, whether they want to have the local authority to provide everything, or whether they wish to have a mix of the other three. It is their choice. I should say, though, to Helen Eady, and I may disappoint her, is that the legislation sets out very clearly that the local authority must offer those four options to individuals. It's not a case of just offering option one, or option two, which you obviously think option one is a conservative uh, type of uh, uh, privatisation agenda, which I would disagree with, because I think the issue about being able to choose when someone comes in to meet your care needs is about your personal need and about independent living, rather than about any political ideology. But what I, I think is important here is that people are, I'll let you back in, is to allow people to have choice around these things and to put in safeguards that empower people but to also fall back in the safety of the local authority when they don't have the confidence to take forward their care arrangements on their own. I'll give way to Helen. Helen Eady. I, th I think the Minister misunderstands what I was meaning. I mean, my concern is fundamentally this. The Conservative government is bringing, down, is bringing out legislation which is talked about by Vince Cable, and the, that legislation is going to erode all the workers' rights that we have right across the United Kingdom. My concern is that if we go down the route that you're proposing and not following option two, is that we could just find that we're actually leading the way, we're leading the charge to that, because there are many individuals who just don't have the human uh, resource um, or the, the human uh, resource uh, capabilities that you and I would expect them to be able to have, because individuals just don't have that. This is about empowering Minister. people to be able to make a decision that best suits their needs. It's not about laying down that you must choose option two or option three or option four or option one. It's about giving people choice. And that's something which individuals with an independent living movement have been calling upon for years. And my understanding is it had broad support 
within all political parties in Scotland and across the UK. Can I say I don't want to overly intervene in the Twitter conversation that Malcolm Chisholm was having with Rosanna Cunningham over the weekend. Um, I've never quite understood having conversations over Twitter where I'm just phoning someone and having the discussion. Uh, but I do think, um, I think it illustrates that I do think the issue around national and local is a debate that will go forward and one which we uh, should continue to have. But I think Christina McKelvey and her contribution also illustrated why we need to make sure that we have statutory underpinning of people's rights and choices around how their care is managed by the types of hurdles that she illustrated in her own personal case that can often be thrown down in order to dissuade people from moving forward and arranging care in their own way. I want to try and touch upon a number of the points that members have raised in the limited time available, President Officer. Uh, the issue of the uh, charging by local authorities, several members have raised, and Jackie Bailey asked me to tell, tell the Chamber when will it actually report. What I can tell her is that the actual review is a causal review, and maybe she can help us in telling us the last time I looked, it was a Labour leadership we had in COSLA as to when they intend to get to the point of finalising that particular report. But what I can assure her of is that we are contributing to that process to assist them in taking forward that piece of work. And the sooner it is completed, the more we can then consider on how we move forward on this particular issue. I should say, I should say, I will let you back in, I should say to Helen Eady, I can't comment on the charges that are applied by housing associations. I noted her point about Fife Council and the change of administration. I can tell her in Falkirk Council, which she did make reference to, is that some home care charges and home care services used to be completely free until Labour and the Conservative Party took over the administration in Falkirk and introduced a whole wave of charges that had never been applied by the previous SNP administration. I'll give way to Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey. Um, can I thank the Minister for doing so? Would he care to remind the Chamber that the working group was actually set up um, by COSLA at the behest of the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government is represented on it, and three years later, we still have no progress on making sure that there is consistency of care charging across Scotland. Surely that's an ambition we share. Minister. What I can say to the member is it is COSLA review group. We are helping them and providing them with information to do it. Maybe she'll use her political influence, if she's got any, to tell the Labour leadership, get on with it and give us a report so we can then move forward. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I turn to the issue of advocacy services that a number of members have raised? And that is about the issue about what level of advocacy will actually be provided. I think there's a misunderstanding that some members think there is no provision in this bill around advocacy because Section 8 of the bill makes it a clear duty for local authorities to direct people to a source of impartial advice and support in order to get assistance in looking at these particular issues. But I'm more than happy to look at where there's further things that we can do to ha try and help to enhance this. But it is about in independent advice rather than it being provided by the local authority. And I would refer members to the bill itself to reflect upon that. Dennis Robertson, I think, in his contribution I think illustrated very well about the need to be much more focused on the outcomes that this bill intends to achieve. This bill has the potential, I believe, to fundamentally change the way in which social care services are delivered in this country in a way that reflects the needs of individuals, gives them greater choice and gives them greater opportunity to lead an independent life. I'm delighted, President Officer, that we appear to have cross-party support at stage one in this bill. I've got no doubt those who have been calling for this type of legislation for many years will welcome the way in which this Parliament has united behind this legislation. I'm determined to make sure that if we are successful in taking this bill through Parliament and having it given royal assent, I will do everything in my power to make sure that it does start to transform life in Scotland in a way that has never been provided before in social care provision in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes the debate on stage one of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill. We now move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 3851 in the name of John Swinney on the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill 
financial resolution. I call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Formally moved. The question this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 4091 in the name of John Swinney on the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill, UK legislation. I call on John Swinney to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary. Formally moved, President Officer. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 4149 on committee membership. These um, are changes to the committee structures um, <coughs> following the ministerial appointments, and I formally move 04149. Motion number 4150 on substitution of committees. I would be obliged if you would move that also. Formally moved, Presiding Officer. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time. There will be five questions to be put as a result of today's business. I just wonder, Minister, if you would perhaps for the next 30 seconds talk about the substitution of committees that you need. Presiding officer, these changes um, will strengthen the SNP's representation across, a, across the committees. Um, I congratulate all the members and look forward to their input on the committees. And I, I know they, those members in new positions look forward to working closely with the opposition members across the chamber in helping take forward the um, government's programme for government. Minister, I think that was your first test. Uh, the first question then is at motion number 4086 in the name of Alec Neil on the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 3851 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 4091 in the name of John Swinney on the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 4149 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 4150 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly.